Good morning. morning. Would you all pray with me, please? Lord, we live by grace. Father, we thank you that you selected those of us who have trusted alone in Christ alone. You selected us before you set the foundations of the earth. You not only selected us, you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And not only every spiritual blessing, you lavish your grace upon us. Grace upon grace. Grace will always exceed our sin because you love us. And Father, I pray that you would help us to grace one another, to be patient with one another, not critical, but to have grace towards one another. And Father, I know that when we live together and we worship together, sometimes we bump into one another. Let us have grace. Sometimes we get offended too easily. Other times we're truly offended. Let us have grace. Let us forgive. Because Christ forgave us, we can forgive others. And Father, I recognize that the most powerful way to help others grow in Christ is through love. Love them enough to tell them the truth. Father, we pray for Sam. We understand he's back in the hospital with an infection. We ask for his healing. Lord, there are many who are not here today who planned to be here. Would you give them healing? There are others who want to be here every week and cannot be. They're now at home. We pray for your richest blessing upon them. We ask that they would feel a part of our family. I thank you for the sound room and for the DVDs and the CDs that they record that can be taken out to our folks so they can play a part in the worship here. I thank you, Father, for the music we have here. I thank you for the choir, how wonderful they sound. I thank you for Alan's hard work and his teamwork. I thank you, Father, for his ministry to them and to us all. And now, Lord, as we turn to your word, we ask that you would open up our minds. Help us, as we've already sung, to turn our eyes Lord Jesus, when we do, the things that annoy us, the things that bother us, you know, they just don't seem so important anymore. Help us to be a a group of folks that are known by their love, by their acceptance, and by their forgiveness. Because we're loving people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's each other. Some of us have walked with Christ for many years, decades. We're still loving them into a furthering relationship, a deeper relationship with Christ. So Lord, now teach through me. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I grew up in a household that loved sports. That my father gave me, even at a very young age, a passion for sports. I remember even as a little guy, long before we had uh, remote controls, that my dad on a Sunday might have our big TV, have one football game on, and he had this little black and white portable TV that was on his TV tray, and that had another football game on. And then he had a radio with a third football game on right here. My dad loved sports. You see, I could tell wherever I was in the house, if I was out back playing, I could tell. And I grew up in the Philadelphia area, and so I love the hometown teams. My dad passed that passion on to me. Yes, I love the Eagles, and yes, I love the Phillies. That's what I grew up with. But I could tell you on any given Sunday, no matter where I was in the house, how they were doing. Because I could hear my dad. And then when I grew up old enough where I could sit still long enough to watch the game with him, you know, I started doing what he did. If 
they were losing. Oh, well, I'm talking to the TV right along with my dad, scolding the team, scolding the coaches, calling the rest blind. If they did well, you know, we're praising them. As I grew older and had my own house, I would watch them. I had but one day off a week, and sometimes it felt like a real waste when I would watch the whole game. It would just be one upset after another. I don't know what was wrong with those guys. And I would get done that game and I would think, what a waste of my time. You see, I was so involved, it was affecting me. And I would be rather tired because I was so emotionally involved in the game. Now, now don't look at me all pious like you've never experienced that, okay? <laughs> you've all been there. And then one day, something happened. VCRs. <laughs> we could record the game. And then we could watch it without commercials. And there was something wonderful about VCRs. It changed my life. I know that they're old hat now, but we can still record the games. And you know what's wonderful about them? I would already know the outcome. <laughs> you see, I had foreknowledge. I had pre-knowledge on how this whole thing was going to work out, and I could watch that game. And if there was an interception, if our quarterback threw an interception, I'd look at it and go, oh, no. And then I'd say, but it's okay. I'd start encouraging him. It's okay. You're going to be fine. Like, I had foreknowledge, so I knew. If there was a fumble, it'd be, oh, no, I can't believe you did that, but it's okay. Why could I watch it through different eyes? Because I had foreknowledge. I had pre-knowledge. I knew that it was going to work out fine in the end. I knew it was going to be rough in the middle. I didn't know how rough because I hadn't seen the game yet. I didn't know how many mistakes they would make, but I knew they would make them. But I knew no matter what, at the end of the game, the scoreboard, I already knew that. And I knew my team was going to win. You have foreknowledge. You've read the last chapter, haven't you? You see, we've read Revelation. We win. Our team wins. Now, we don't know what the game is going to be like. We don't know who's going to get injured. We don't know who will get sidelined. We don't know what things are going to happen. But we do know in the end... We win because we have been given foreknowledge because we've read the last book in the New Testament, the book of Revelation. It doesn't remove the pain, but it does remove the angst. It doesn't remove the fact that we are sorrowful, but it does remove the sting. We know that in the end, it's going to work out. We don't know what it's going to look like in the in interim, but we do know, with our foreknowledge, it's going to be okay. And it changes the way we watch events in life. It still hurts, but we know it's going to be okay. The subject of this morning's message is through thick and thin, good times and bad, God is still on his throne and God will guide everything to his desired end and God will play and he will score the finishing winning touchdown and he's on his throne and he's still changing things in life when we look to our coach and ask him he's still in control Would you please turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament? You'll remember that it's Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then all the T's. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, 1 Thessalonians, well, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy. But if you would turn to Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, we're going to go through this in three steps. The mystery revealed the ministry given and then what it means to me first the mystery revealed 
In verses 1 to 7, let me read them for you. Ephesians chapter 1, or chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, dash. Did you notice? There's a dash there. He doesn't finish his sentence. He stops, boom, right in the middle of his sentence. And he goes on a long digression. And what we're looking at today is a long digression. Now, he doesn't have Alzheimer's. He knows where he's headed. He didn't forget what he's saying. But in the midst of his digressions are some of the deepest theology in the Bible. And Ephesians is no exception. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, he will not pick that up again until verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. So everything we talk about today is a digression. Look what he says. Verse 2. If indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief in this same letter. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. The first word I want to talk about there well, the first thing I want to talk about is, for this reason, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, isn't what he says. The prisoner of Christ Jesus. He's writing from jail. This portion of the letter is framed with his suffering. Look at verse 13. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are for your glory. Now, why would they be upset? Well, as the man who spent three years with you and was your pastor for three years and you know that his heart is on fire for Christ and he has led you to Christ and he has helped you grow in Christ and then you find out he's in jail. Well, hello, we must be on the losing side if he's in jail. Things are going very wrong. Maybe what he taught me is wrong. Maybe I shouldn't follow him. Obviously, the Jews don't like him. They stuck him in jail. The Romans are holding him in jail. Well, this guy's a jailbird. Paul writes to them and said, I'm a prisoner, not of Rome, not of the Jews, but of Jesus Christ. And when something wrong goes wrong in our life, you must remember that nothing comes into your life that has not filtered through the mighty hands of God. Paul knew that. Paul understood that all filters through, even being in prison. And even today, had Paul not been in prison, would we have these letters? He was quite a dynamo. I'm not sure he would have taken the time. I don't know. We don't have to figure it out because God allowed him to be in jail. And then he wrote these letters. And these prison epistles that I talk about, this is one that he wrote from prison. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. If indeed you have heard of the stewardship. That word stewardship actually means that it is a household manager. In a large household, they had managers. And those managers had control over the finances and accountability. Great deal of responsibility for in a large household, they had to account for everything. It involved expectations. You will perform to a certain level. It had privilege, that you had the privilege to be able to uh, instruct others and to orchestrate your days. But it had accountability. And so it was serious. Think of the parable of the mind is when the owner went away and when he came back, he gave everyone a responsibility. And when he came back, there was an accounting for what 
he had given them. Did you get me more or did you get me less? This stewardship was given to Paul. It was a stewardship of God's economy to dispense of the fat and unfathomable grace and riches of Christ to preach the gospel. But there's a mystery here that he talks about. Notice the mystery he talks about. The mystery, the Greek word that is used, I've told you before, mysterion, does not mean something that's spooky or eerie or we'll just never figure this out. That is not how that word is used. The Greek word behind here, mystery, means this is something that's never been revealed before. This was locked up in the heart of God from the beginning and he's never revealed it to anyone else and he's revealing it now through me to you. Notice that Paul says in verse 3 that by revelation, Paul did not say, you know, I was thinking the other day and it occurred to me. I don't know why I didn't think of this before. No. No. This did not come through his thinking and his theology. It came by direct revelation by God. That by revelation there was made known to me the mystery. What is this mystery? The mystery, as he goes on to state, is that Jews and Gentiles were going to be at peace with one another that God was going to take two factions who hated each other. Now you remember that in that age, there was the Jew. God had made his own people. He started with Abraham and went forward. And God said, I'm going to work with my own group of people, the Jews. Anybody who was not born Jewish is a Gentile. And so there was the Jews and everybody else. And God had marked the Jews with certain ceremonial laws and certain practices that made them real oddballs. They had one God, not many gods. And the way they worshipped him was different. And that made them oddballs. And that made them hated. And they hated others. Today, the real miracle here would be like looking at Israel and all the Arabs. Well, they hate each other, right? Isn't that obvious? What if you read in the newspaper that Arabs and Jews are now getting together and they're not going to worship at the synagogue or the mosque. They're going to a place in between and they're now worshiping and getting along together. Would you think that was, that was false news? You'd really have to investigate that. Is it, could that really be true? But that is precisely the mystery. God was taking Jews and he was taking Gentiles. And he didn't put the Gentiles in with the Jews and he didn't take the Jews and put them in with Gentiles. He formed a new group and he brought them together in unity. Do you know what he called that new group? The church. That's the mystery. God took the Jews and the Gentiles who hated each other, brought them together and made them into one unit. That doesn't mean that the Gentiles are now Jews, and it doesn't mean the Jews are now Gentiles. It means they're new. It doesn't mean that we are Israel. We are not. There is Israel, and there's us. We are not open to all the promises of Israel. We did not replace Israel. God will deal with Israel, even though they're on the shelf for now. And so the mystery is, there's this new group of folks. Now, culturally, you may not realize this, but so deep was their hatred that there was not a line in the sand, but there was a rift larger than the Grand Canyon between Jews and Gentiles. Do you realize that a Jewish mother would not help a Gentile mother deliver her baby? She couldn't, because she would be bringing into this world another degraded human being. And so she would not help her. You do know that if the Jews were going to go from the southern region of Jerusalem and they wanted to go up to the Sea of Galilee, this quickest way between two points is a direct line, right? That meant they had to go through Samaria. 
And Samaria was where it was, where those half-breeds lived. Half Jewish, half Gentile. And so they didn't go through that land. They went 150 miles walking out of their way to go around Samaria. That's how much they hated the Gentiles. There was hatred. And yet God was bringing the two together in a new unit called the church. That has not been told in the Old Testament. It was not revealed in the Old Testament. It wasn't revealed until the New Testament with Paul. And so the mystery was that God had reconciled two groups of people who had irreconcilable differences. But all things are possible with God. Amen? Amen. The ministry given by God. Look at verse 8. To me. Well, let me start in 7. Of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. Verse 10, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Paul calls himself the least. Is he being overly humble here? No, he told Timothy that he was the chief of all sinners. Well, you know, how could that be that he would say that? Do, do you, know, you know a little bit about Paul, right? You know a little bit about his bio? Let me remind you. Keep a finger here and just go a few pages over to Philippians. The book of Philippians, chapter 3. You'll learn just a little bit about Paul. You probably already know this. Philippians chapter 3. Start in verse 4. Philippians 3. Keep a finger in Ephesians. Philippians 3, verse 4. Paul says about himself, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, <laughs> you don't know who you're dealing with. I have a lot more to brag about than you. I was circumcised the eighth day. You see, he has in impeccable credentials he has impeccable birth order he was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel the tribe of Benjamin that's important first their very first king came from the tribe of Benjamin of which he was probably named after he had the same name Saul and so he was a tribe of the Benjamin he was a Hebrew of Hebrews he's no half-breed as to the law he was a Pharisee. He was top-notch. He went to the Harvard of his day. He was well-educated, learned under Gamaliel. Paul was on a fast track to the top. He was persecuting the church. See what he says in verse 6? As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness, which is the law, I was found blameless. I was keeping the law. I was rising to the top. I was better than, than them all. You want to brag? You have nothing on me. And yet, when he met Christ, he dumped it because he found out what was really important. And now, in the book of Ephesians, he can tell us, I was the least of the least. The adjective he uses there would lead us to believe, I was the leaster. Literally, I was the leaster. I was lower than everybody. Why would he say that? Because he was persecuting the church. He didn't realize it. He did not realize that he was persecuting his own Lord who became his Savior. And so Paul had a pedigree that was impeccable. He was a Roman citizen. His parents very likely were wealthy. He now was given the assignment by God Notice that Paul didn't rise to this assignment. This assignment was given to him. God gave him this job. He didn't acquire it. He didn't rise to the top. God gave him the ministry.
It is this administration or dispensation that we would call the dispensation of grace that God gave to Paul. And it came with a responsibility. Responsibility to trust alone in Christ alone. Look at verse 10. This was done so that, for this purpose, that the manifold, the word there would mean multicolored, the, the manifold wisdom of God might now be known through the church to the rulers. Isn't that interesting? To the rulers. You see, we want God to change our culture. But I see very plainly that God may be the establisher of government, but government is not God's chosen instrument to transform the world. Never was. You know what is? The church. You see, before a guy gets to the White House, he's going to check in with the church house. If my people who are called by my name, God works through his people. He did in the Old Testament, and now the New Testament, we, we are called the church now, and God works through his people. This is why we pray. This is why we work. This is why we seek God's will. This is why you are so incredibly important in your family and neighborhood. You matter because you've trusted Christ and God works through us to change things. Again, we're loving people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We have been given that mystery. God's chosen instrument to impact is the church. But look what else it says. It's through the church to be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. What does that mean? If Paul uses that same term in Ephesians 6, 12, where he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Oh, so even the demons watch the church to see God's manifold wisdom, but not just the wicked angels, the good angels as well are also watching. Listen to what Peter says. You don't have to go there, but 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, you can write that down. 1 Peter 1.12 It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. The heavenly host is watching, folks. They're watching and they watch us and they say, it's amazing, God, what you are doing through them. It's amazing your wisdom. We never would have figured this out. And God amazes the heavenly host day after day. When somebody trusts Christ, the angels are probably saying, we never thought he'd come or she would come. But God, we celebrate with them and with you. When you make a decision that you've never made before, when all of a sudden God's transforming your life to where people matter more than money, where people matter more than anything else, now... You are an amazement to the angels who are watching. And they are amazed at God's grace and his manifold witness. That's what this means. This ministry, again, was not acquired by Paul. He didn't climb the ladder to get it. He was climbing the wrong ladder, leaning against the wrong building. And God in his grace turned Paul around and took the greatest adversary of the church and made him the greatest missionary of the church. Do you think the angels were amazed at that one? And now number three. What about me? You. This is the question you would ask yourself. What about me? Look at verses 11 through 13. And this was in accordance with with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access 
through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. Three privileges that God has given you that are listed right here. The first one, the privilege of purpose. When you trust alone in Christ alone, God has a job for you. And that is to be a witness for him. You're part of his eternal purpose. You see, this mystery that was then still is a mystery to many. And God is drawing you in to be a part, to serve. You have meaning and purpose in your life. Love others into a relationship with Christ. You have the privilege of access. That's number two. You see, we can come to God boldly and confidently when you trust alone in Christ alone. You move from being a mere creation of God to being a child of God. Look at John chapter 1. He gave them who believed in him the right to become children of God. You become a child of God and you have immediate access. That means at 1.30 in the morning when you wake up in a panic and a sweat for someone in your family, you can go right to the throne room of heaven, knock on a door, and God says, how you doing? Come on in. Let's talk. 24-7 access to God. We have that privilege. That privilege of access, we say, some say, well, prayer is talking to God. That's true. But more importantly, and I think more accurately, praying is asking. Asking. You look in the New Testament, you look throughout that and the Old Testament. Asking, always asking, always asking. Well, can I ask for anything? Sure, you can ask for anything. You may not get it. Jesus said in John 16, 24, it's for God's glory. When you ask for something that God's going to get the glory out of, you bet he's going to answer. Because it's what's best for you. It's what's best for the people you pray for. And the third privilege is to suffer. That's not one we want. The third privilege we have is to suffer. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart in my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. You see, Paul made it very clear that he was not appointed just to serve but to suffer and he wanted to know the fellowship of suffering for Christ and then be rewarded for it and this is where we get mixed up we think if I'm suffering something has gone way wrong and I've stepped off the path I did something wrong or God I don't believe you just let that happen to me Forgetting all along that God's purpose for you, God's main reason, what he's doing in your life, the goal he has for you is to mold you into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Okay? Romans 8, 29. That will take some struggle. That will take some suffering. But he will take you there and he won't ask for your permission. But he will greatly reward you and in the midst of that, you will find freedom. All the things you worried about, you no longer have to worry about because you know who has control. And you know that in dark times, he's still there. I see it as a pastor over and over again in the hospitals and the funeral homes. People that look up and say, God is with me. He's given me a peace in this that I never thought I'd have. Some of you have been there. You see, Paul did not want them to lose heart. And I don't want you to lose heart. God has given you purpose in your life. He's revealed a mystery to you. I hear people say all the time, I just don't understand how so-and-so can't understand the gospel. It's so simple. Maybe you haven't understood the gospel. Do you understand that Everyone born into this world is headed on a fast track to hell. Not my words, God's words. But God sent his son. This is the main reason Jesus came, was to seek and save that which was lost. You see, Jesus paid for your sins. All of them. 
past, present, and future. And he's asking you, will you trust me? Come to Christ. Ask him to save you. And he will. For those of us who have, we have been conscripted into God's army because God works through us to reveal this mystery. How are you doing with that? When was the last time you shared the love of Christ with a neighbor? You. A friend. A family member. It's God's will. God wants you to know the joy of sharing life's greatest gift with other people. And he's chosen the church. He's entrusted the mystery to you. Are you sharing it? Are you making sure it's not a secret? Now people may reject you and say, I don't want to do that. Is that a failure? No. You're called a witness. Witnesses tell what they know. God holds us responsible for contact, not conversion. You see, it's guilt-free. He wants you to tell. He'll do the converting. That's not your job. Second application is the ministry. Do you understand how God spells faith? Think about it. How does God spell faith? I'll spell it for you. F, as in Frank, E, E, T, as in Tom. Feet. You can say all day long, and I can say all day long, I believe, I believe, I believe, and God said, yeah, but your feet are still right there. You're not moving. Do you trust me enough to actually act on what you know? God judges our true faith by our feet. Are you moving? Are you working? Are you trusting God enough to move forward with your feet? Jesus has given us the authority to do so. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, make disciples, lead others to me. God has entrusted this mystery to you and to me. He's entrusted this ministry. It's almost like putting five gold bars into the hands of a baby. What are they going to do with that? But God has entrusted to us great wealth. We can do it. You can do it and I can do it. Because we have the Spirit of God inside of us saying, Go get him. Go get him. I've already won the game. You just go. Let's pray. Father, our desire is to be pleasing to you. I pray you seal these words to our hearts that you be glorified. And Father, there are folks in our lives that we pray for right now. Give us boldness to share Christ and the love of Christ with them. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And let me pray for you all. Father, we came to worship you this morning. And now I pray that we leave changed and changing because we felt your presence. We felt it through each other as the Spirit reaches out to encourage each other. We felt it through the music. We responded through giving. We feel it through your word as your word comes to dwell in us permanently. Now, God, seal your word to our hearts that we would not be discouraged, but be encouraged because we know what the end is. We've read the last chapter, and so we have foreknowledge. And we understand that our future is very bright, bright indeed. And now, Lord, I pray for those who have trusted you, who are struggling, give them peace. For those who refuse to trust you and have not trusted you yet, do not give them rest until they do. Make them miserable until they find the Prince of Peace. Never will they know peace until they know you. And that's what we want for all. We want for them to know you so that they know true peace. We say it and pray it because we love them. And now, Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.